Coming up next on Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable, an effort to kill the state's new education standards is defeated. Also tonight, we'll have the latest on attempts to extend the use of public money for private education. And a state lawmaker and candidate for Congress goes public about his sexuality in the wake of SB 1062. The Journalists Roundtable is next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizons Journalists Roundtable. I'm Ted Simons. Joining us tonight, Jim Small of the Arizona Capital Times, Howard Fisher of Capital Media Services, and Hank Stevenson with the Arizona Capital Times. Arizona's recently implemented college and career ready standards, better known as Common Core, survives an attack by Republican lawmakers who see the program as a, a federal attempt to usurp states' rights. This was uh, this was killed with the help of what, five Republicans, huh? Yeah, there were five Republicans who sided with the 13 Democrats in the chamber to vote against this bill. And, and the bill would have basically said that Arizona has to, can no longer use these standards that were adopted in 2010 uh, and, and, and are quickly, fastly being implemented and, and getting ready to have, you know, one, one of the big discussions this year is getting a test to test for the standards. and. So now there's legislation trying to get us out of these standards altogether. And, you know, it, it was it was a big victory for the business community, which has been making a very strong push this year in support of these uh, th these higher standards, standards that they say will make Arizona's high school graduates better prepared for both college and for the workforce. And that was really the key, because the business community, which was a little late coming to the table on 1062 and definitely a little late on 1070 several years ago, suddenly figured out, if we're going to stop this stuff, if we're going to stop the wingnuts from the Republican Party from controlling the place, we've got to be out there. I mean, the lobbyists for the Phoenix Chamber literally told the Education Committee, if you adopt this and go back to what would be 1999 standards, Arizona graduates will not be employable. We will go to other states to look for our graduates. What was the reason for getting rid of something that had already been passed, was, was implemented by virtue of a, of a group of folks, including Arizona educators? I mean, there were so many. It's already in place. Uh, it's already costing why get rid of it? And pulling out of it would throw the whole system into chaos. Um, I think getting uh, getting rid of it is going back to kind of the, the Tea Party wing of the Republican Party just really does not like Common Core. Anything seen as national standards uh, is tied to Obamacare or well, something. It was even better than that. You'll love this. So Al Melvin is sponsoring the bill. David Bradley says to him, so Senator, what is it exactly you don't like in the bill? And Al says, well, lots of people don't like it. Well, Senator, what don't you like? Well, you go in and find it. So when pressed for what the problems are, the prime sponsor can't even say. It's more this sort of paranoia that these are national standards. They were adopted by the National Governors Association, including this governor, by state school chiefs, supported by Hoopenthal, but somehow this is seen as as Obama, I guess. Uh, indeed, it's, it's Arizona had input, as we said, in developing the standards. Hoopenthal's got strong support here, uh, strong support from the business community. The go even if this thing had passed, the governor wasn't likely to sign it anyway, was she? Uh, she officially doesn't comment on legislation <laughs> until it reaches her desk. However, uh, I think it, it was pretty well assumed that she would have vetoed it. I mean, she has been an ardent supporter of these higher education standards for several years now. And, you know, people who are close to her said, ah, you know, don't worry about it. Even if it gets through, we've got a pretty good backstop back there who can stop this. All right. Uh, Howie, let's, let's get move on uh, because, that again, th that likely would not have gone through anyway. However, no. what's going on with expand? And they don't like to call them vouchers, but let's call it oh, cool. that because it's, it's easy. It's, it's a voucher-like program. Yeah, well, it's easier to say it, too. Yes. So what's going on with this bill to expand public money into private education? Well, there are actually several bills. Some of them make minor changes, like, for example, children of the military or more disabled kids. The big bill essentially says we're eventually going to have everyone be eligible. Right now, it started off as a bill for disabled. Mm -hmm. Then it became any child in a school rated D or F, which probably takes in, theoretically, up to 200,000 students, though there's a year-to-year -year cap, at least in place for the time being. This bill would say if you qualify for free or reduced price lunch, 
you would qualify. That brings us up to 600,000. Then, because of the way you can't do it on a student by student basis, we're going to do it in any school that has a lot of kids that qualify, which brings us up to 800,000 out of 1.1 million kids. What about 73% or some kids might be eligible for this? However, there's supposed to be a cap at 5,000 too. How, how do you work those numbers? I, I, right now, even the the potential number of students that could be enrolling in the ESA student in, in the ESA program uh, is nowhere near what is actually enrolled. Um, there, there's a cap in place currently and we're, we're nowhere near hitting it. Well with that in mind, is this, is, is this effort a response to this low participation? I mean it could be. Uh, I think they've been chipping away at this year after year. They've really been well, one thing after another little by little trying to expand this program. Yeah, I, I think this is less about trying, you know, a reaction to the low participation as much as it is like how we said. I mean the goal is to make this available to every student. You know, that was one of the arguments and, and one of the fears I think from the the education establishment when this program was created and it was upheld in court as being a valid program was that this was going to be kind of the camel's nose under the tent for voucher-like programs that, that it could then be expanded because any legal challenge at that point would be able to rest on the shoulders of the previous one that said that this was legal. Yeah, and the real key is, you know, choice. Now, from the perspective of the education community, it means we're going to take the money that would otherwise go to public schools. We're going to take it and we're going to give it in these scholarships, quote unquote, just to parents to use for private parochial schools, tutoring books, homeschooling, or whatever else. And to the extent that you're moving money out of public schools, which still have to be there, I think that's the real fear. It's not like, well, if a charter school loses students, it closes down. Public school, Roosevelt District needs to be there. Madison District needs to be there. They have buildings, they have bonds, they have things to pay off, and yet we're going to take away the base, and they're going to be, you know, the question of which students are still stuck there as opposed to which students say, well, I've got a voucher and my parents will pay something extra, so I'm going to go to Brophy. Well, those schools are still going to be there, and the accountability is still going to be there for those schools. What kind of accountability will there be for these private schools? There's much less accountability, and I think it's worth noting that this bill has gone up before the House uh, or was scheduled to go up mm -hmm. before the House twice now, uh, once this week, once last week, and has been kind of kicked down the road a little bit mm -hmm. each time. Uh, the sponsor says, you know, we've had a couple of Republicans absent. I don't want to put it up unless my numbers are sure. Uh, from what I hear, the, the vote is going to be extremely close, and uh, there, there's been a couple of changes in the last couple of days where the votes might not even be there to get this sure. out of the House. The issue on accountability, to be fair, is the argument that the parents are the ultimate accountability. If mom and dad are happy with, with the education that, that Junior is getting, it's fine. But that also ignores the fact that sometimes mom and dad just want Junior going to a school where they don't teach about communism, homosexuality, that, that, you know, that we've only been here for 6,000 years. And so the question of are they getting a good education in terms of mom and dad's view may not be exactly accurate. Well, and always uh, in these kinds of situations, yes, you can find out a year later that it wasn't what you thought it was, it wasn't up to snuff. You've lost a year of your child's education. And, but that's true, but we have that with open enrollment now. I mean, you can enroll your kid in any public or charter school now and But again, know, hopefully, the accountability issue, though, is still yes. supposed to be, okay, what, what happens with this thing? What happens Monday? What, what, what do you see? Well, I, <laughs> like Hank said, you know, this thing has been scheduled twice uh, to, to go to the floor and, and it's been pulled back both times, uh, ostensibly because the votes really aren't there. And so, I mean, we'll find out find out Monday afternoon whether those votes materialize, whether whatever changes are, are in the works for this bill are enough to assuage the concerns of some of the Republicans that are wavering on this mm -hmm. bill. Let me throw out two other points. Number one, a much narrower version of expansion failed in committee, so that indicates that perhaps the tide is turning. There's also the question of the ultimate backstop, the governor we're talking about. Look, she is a proponent of choice. She got into the legislature because of education. But it's one thing to say we're going to help students with special needs, disabled, DNF schools. And I think it may be, you know, for her to say, you mean eventually this could mean 800, 900,000, a million kids? Even she may have a hard time with that. And we saw a fiscal note today that shows it actually could cost the state more than they're paying now because of the way that, that, that the, the state aid is, is based. With that information and, and just the general tenor now of the legislature and, and everything going on down there with 1062, does that change? I mean, last year at this time, I hate to use last year because there was another crisis last year, <laughs> but I mean, 
has the mood changed down there to where something like this, which may have been more easily passed, isn't quite so easy anymore? I, I think it has to some degree. I think there are a handful of lawmakers kind of in the middle who are saying, all right, let, let, let's focus on what we really need to do and not go out there and create too many headlines. Let's uh, kind of buckle down on the budget, which they haven't done yet. But uh, I, I think that there are a, a handful of lawmakers, those votes in the middle that really matter, that are reassessing what they want to do this year. Let me throw out one other th thought on this. Defeat of Senate Bill 1062 at the hands of the governor, a couple of Republicans deciding even before the vote, some deciding afterwards. All of a sudden, I think there may be a feeling there, you know, it's okay not to vote with Kathy Herod and the world will not end. Vouchers are part of the Center for Arizona Policy's agenda. And it may be that this has caused a few of them to develop a spine and say, no, Kathy, we're not going with you on this one. All right, we'll, we'll watch out for that one. We'll try to keep tabs on that one. Uh, we got a poll coming out here with a couple of interesting questions. First of all, it's, uh, regarding the governor's race, I know it's early, but still, I mean, undecided. Uh, governor undecided is going to win in a landslide here. So, but what's going on with, are, are, is no one connecting any, what's happening here? Well, I, at this point, I think everyone's still out there trying to raise money or qualify for clean elections money. We really haven't seen any, <laughs> Any, any meaningful activity out of any of the gubernatorial candidates outside of, you know, I mean, they're making the rounds amongst the, the, the party activists and, and the different Republican groups and business groups and stuff like that. But they're really, they haven't started doing that communication that you're, you're going to see eventually with the general electorate. And that's why you, you see uh, this poll, I think, had like 34, 35 yeah. percent. Previous polls we've seen had it north of 50 percent. And it, it, it's just a function, I think, of, of it being relatively early and, and there not being anyone with uh, with a high stature and the other part of it and some of it's chicken and egg is we're not paying attention to them you know we seek them out on comments on 1062 and a few bills like that but other than that i don't care what doug ducey's doing you know i mean it's it's early we're all concentrating on what's going on at the capitol and you know ken bennett's plans to get rid of somehow the income tax is yeah okay we'll talk about it later we got christine jones who's seemed like she jumped quite a bit from the december poll and uh, scott smith double from the december poll Doug Ducey's down from when they did a poll in December. I mean, Andrew Thomas is even, I, I, again, very early uh, polling, you know, at this time of year, take it for what it's worth. But I would imagine the Ducey camp's got to be a little concerned about this. Yeah, and even in the Capitol crowd, uh, people put Ducey up very close to the top, if not the top, uh, this early in the game, which, you know, it, it could go either way. But for him to show it like 6% just says uh, nobody besides the people uh, at this table are listening. But, but I, you know, I, I think if you look at the race in the it, it, with the kind of through the lens of right now they're, they're trying to get money and then they're going to be spending money here, that's the next phase. Certainly Doug Ducey is, has been at the front leading the pack mm -hmm. when it comes to raising money. I mean, he, he reported raising more than a million dollars in 2013, like 800,000 of that is, is geared for the primary. So, you know, th that's the kind of money that, you know, a guy like Ken Bennett who's going to run under clean elections, he'll get $800,000 total. And, you know, so Doug Ducey entered the year with that. And, and so I, I think in, in that sense, when it comes time to start spending that money and, and they, they kind of open yeah. up the faucet, he's going to be in a good position to, to really get his message out to voters. And, and these numbers are, are just going to start, you know, whipsawing around. Yeah, the late yeah. kick there. And, and the fact is, and we're getting things like endorsed, Fife Symington endorsing Doug Ducey. Who cares? You know, I mean, you know, quite frankly, you know, as I say, same reason, back to where I started. We're not paying attention. You know, there's nothing to r make it rise to the top. So what does this do for Fred Duvall? I mean, does this give, does it, is it good for him to see all these numbers? Is it bad that no one knows who Fred Duvall is? Well, he's, you know, you see, we're talking now about why is nobody paying attention to an August primary, and now we're saying why is nobody paying attention to a November general election? Mm -hmm. Again, no focus on, no need to focus on him, although I did see we did get some Tucsonan who entered the gubernatorial race for the Democrats, say a guy named Woolsey or something, who I've never heard of. Maybe, maybe that's exactly what Fred needs. He needs somebody to fight against. Right now he's just sort of, hey, look at me, I'm here, hello. <laughs> All right, uh, so we'll keep, we'll keep tabs of these particular numbers, but it, you'd have to say that Ken Bennett is the front runner right now, isn't he? Well, I think certainly if you look at, at every poll that's come out in the past year or so, uh, when, when it comes to those numbers, yeah, he starts the race, I think, in, in the poll position in terms of, of share of the electorate. 
But, it's, you know, someone remarked to me that if you, if you look at this like a baseball game, we're, we're yes. entering the bottom of the third right yeah. now. There's a lot yeah. of baseball left yeah, to play. They're, they're, okay. And that's really a function of the fact that he's been around for a long time. He's probably Name the only familiar. one that the sure. average Arizonan has heard of. Sure. Okay. Uh, Kirsten Cinema. apparently it's not switching districts. She's uh, staying in the CD9, not going to CD. So how serious was she about this? Do we know? No, she's been very tight-lipped about this. Even the thing that she put out there saying I'm sticking around in my district was a uh, paragraph on Facebook. You know, we've heard some things that maybe she was angling for a better position in Congress. Maybe she was going for an appropriations appointment and wanted to have something to say to leadership that, hey, look, I'm, I'm staying out of this. You're welcome. Uh, you know, what, what do I welcome. get out of this? I mean, I would imagine National Democrats would have been furious yeah. with her well, if she'd made a change. And, I mean, there's a whole bunch of things. I think that by letting it bleed this long, it did not look good for her. I mean, it made her look opportunistic. The fact that she would even say, well, I... I grew up there, but I'm living here, but I'm considering running on this district, which has been largely a Latino district, and I'm not. It made her look like, like very opportunistic. Now, um, the other thing is, quite frankly, you know, while she might have a problem, you know, look, general elections in CD9 are always going to be an issue, given the nature of the district. CD7 is a heavily Democratic district. She might not get nominated. I mean, if you found a couple of folks who would line up against her, she could suddenly wind up her sure thing suddenly That's, becomes a real problem. That was always my question. Could she even win a Democratic primary? Now, a lot of folks say yes, because the, the, the Latino vote might have been uh, split if you had more than one Latino candidate there. But if you had one, it's a 66 percent Latino district. Sure, it, it is. And, and, you know, and then it gets down to turnout. And what's the what's the Latino turnout in the district? Latino turnout tends to be lower uh, than than. Uh, you know, other demographics. Uh, but, you know, the, the fact that she had a million dollars, I think, to take into that race would have given her a clear demonstrable advantage. But, uh, it, you know, it, if you believe that they looked at the race seriously, then I think you'd have to conclude that they thought that they couldn't win in that district. Yes. Otherwise, why wouldn't they be running in that district? Yeah, I think, please. I wanted to see some cinema campaign signs with a little accent mark on them, <laughs> cinema or something. Well, <laughs> you never know. Uh, and, and also, and, and very busy week, Howie. Steve Gallardo says, I'm gay. I'm gay. Or and actually he says, he's, he's gay. Well, well, you know, we either way, I mean, you know, not that there's anything wrong with that to use the old Seinfeld line. Um, it was one of those things, look, um, I was talking to Jim before the show and he said, look, a lot of insiders knew it. My gaydar isn't that good. Um, I, he's a 40 some year old single man. Okay, that's fine. Um, I think he found two things. Number one, 1062 provided a good, good timing, a great excuse to say, wait, this, this would affect me if people can discriminate. And number two is, if he's running for Congress, somehow the issue would come out and you have it come out on your own timing. Now he looks like a hero. Now he looks, he, he looks brave. He's decided to make that, that, that announcement on his own time. He's, and that always makes sense. And he's also the gay candidate in the race. Yeah. I mean, it can't hurt really. I mean, it is a Latino dis district, they have somewhat different views than your traditional progressive Democrat on homosexuality. But, you know, in, in a district like that, I don't imagine that it hurts him any. And, and at the same, you know, the district also does have, you know, a, a pretty significant mm -hmm. gay community yeah. uh, in kind of the, the eastern part of that district. Impact on his political future. I mean, is, is, does this help or hurt this particular campaign race? Oh, I... I don't know. I mean, I, I guess I guess it helps as much as anything. I mean, he certainly got got headlines out of it, and, and he's getting lauded by people like how he said for for doing it in a way that makes him, you know, certainly comes off as being you know kind of brave and, 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 and the fact, making. Yeah. yeah, and the fact is that one of the other polls we we hadn't talked about was the issue that even among Latinos, you know, the issues of gay marriage and civil unions is not the you know oh my God it'll never happen again. So it, it I don't know that it hurts him at all, and the people who it would hurt him be, by being gay would not vote for him in the first place. Well, let's talk about that poll. 45% okay with the state allowing gay, 45% with 32 who were against the idea of gay marriage still being for civil unions. And, and that's really the key. You know, the 45% is pretty consistent with polls we've seen over the last three, four, five years. The civil union part is sort of what surprised me because if you look in there, a majority of Republicans who voted for Mitt Romney two years ago say, yeah, I may not like gay marriage, but I'm in favor of civil unions. 
I mean, this is a sea change for a state that passed a constitutional ban in 2008. So what does that mean for the future as far as any sort of referendum, any sort of initiative? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, there's one plan for 2016. Uh, some of the LGBT groups have been working towards an education campaign. They're trying to get that number closer to 50, 51 before they actually put this on the ballot. That was kind of the hang up with some the, the ballot initiative that had started and very quickly fizzled out this year is uh, the gay groups wouldn't lend their support. They say we need two more years and we've got a lock on this and any motion now will just set us back. We it, don't want to lose. Does that make sense though? Uh, because I, I think Kathy Herod was the one who said once this media frenzy over 1062 goes away, no, those numbers will look, change. Ka Kathy Herod blames every loss on the media frenzy. Well, it's I, all I, the I media's fault. I understand that, Howie, but get past who said it, what was said. The is fact there, is, is there no, validity there? No, because th every year everybody knows another person who's gay, another person who's married and gay perhaps from another state. And every year that another state does this, all of a sudden you realize that the parade of horribles has not happened. You know, Kathy likes to trot out the fact that the ideal situation for a child is to be raised in an intact family with a mother and a father. And she's, I said, well, that's fine. But I said, you haven't answered the other half of the question. Is a child better off being raised by a single parent as opposed to two mommies? Well, I don't know about that. We have more families like that. People are seeing it every day. We have professional sports people who are gay and somehow people are still watching basketball. People are still watching football. I was watching basketball last night. That was quite a game. Yes. Did you watch the game, Howie? No, I didn't. I, I, didn't I was covering the, the, the morons at the legislature. What's the matter with you? Uh, please. Well, well, you know, I want to add something to the, the idea of a referendum in 2016. It may not be necessary. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, we, we've got how many states? Four or five states in the past six months have uh, judges have struck down their gay marriage bans. Arizona, there's a lawsuit filed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if, if, yeah. you f if you follow the trajectory, I mean, this is going to happen. It's going to go to the U.S. Supreme Court. It'll be up to them, and that case may well come before yeah. 2016. All right. We'll stop it right there. Good stuff, guys. Thanks for joining us. We appreciate it. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great weekend. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.